And this is where we just drilled. It's again, 4.75 from here to here. Now, I had Vicky moments ago suspend the nylon, the nylon seal back here to the opening that we cut earlier. But we're not going to run it directly. Obviously, we'll go through the aileron well. So we're going to go through this bottom forward corner that we did for the drain. And um, so I took a magic marker and I marked right up over the top of this, these, these holes. Now I'm going to try and, and run, uh, I'll drill a hole here and here, and then eventually I'll get down to the surface of the wing and um, drill holes along the surface and then bring it to the forward corner of the opening. Um, we'll drill those holes and then come back and give you dimensions. Okay, we're back. I got my drill out, 3 16 You can see there's my marks here and here. It's a straight line from here to the, from, it's a straight line from, from here all the way to the forward corner of that aileron closeout. So now I'm going to put this about right in the middle of the rib. And I'm going to even center the back of the drill on the nylon seal so that as I go through, I'm aiming right at the other point. And you're wondering, why am I bothering to do it this way? It's because I, I, I want the smoothest possible rudder movement. And I get that by generating a straight line with as few angular changes as possible. Now at this stage, I can go right to the bottom here, to drill directly beneath this point and drill through. I'm going to drill these other points and we'll be back with you to show you the results. Okay, we're just, we're, here's our marks again, right there, so the two marks. I'll place the drill bit on the surface and you notice I'm pointing down. You're thinking, oh, he's going to go into the skin. Flex the drill bit. Okay, there's a start. And I'm even pointing the drill bit somewhat at my, where I want to make my corner. So the other end is already um, drilled. Well oversized, not you, but no big deal. Now this is the only place where I have to make a slight bend. But this being nylon, it's self-lubricating and it will never wear out that corner. So now we are where we want to be. And um, I can put a little tension on it. Five minute epoxy in a few places. Put down some glass um, to hold it and we're all set. Back with you shortly. Okay, we're back and we're going to describe to you a process make you feel comfortable about where you're going to lay this conduit in regards to its ability to move and decrease the, um, the friction from the change that has to occur in this line. We have described here where a we're approximately, plus or minus the sixteenth of an inch, where the hinge line is on the other side. So when we describe this arc coming into here, it comes from this point. A pair of dividers there, and you can see where I follow the dotted line. And it starts to come in more profoundly at an angle here. So we have to figure a compromise. The first portion of the arc is through here, described like so. We'll just keep describing that arc like so. Well, by the time the end of the rudder control horn comes inside, it's not coming inside much. So what we're going to do is we're going to run this rudder cable conduit as you see it here. And we're going to run it about an inch from the inside edge here. We have to have room for the end of the horn, for the swedge, and for this to be able to move as it changes angle. It's going to swing down as the horn comes inside. If this is badly placed like so, what it'll do is as it gets to the end, it will bend the end of the cable and eventually it'll break your swedge. So we're going to compromise and about right where this screw is, I presently have holding the wing against the fixture, is about where I'm going to want to be. Now your, your structures here 
this tapers out and this is where you start going carbon to carbon. We have to put this in place and then with super glue and check and see if the, when the wing comes down that it doesn't grab a hold of this. If it does, we're going to have to grind away some material and make certain there's sufficient room for this to move inside the wing. Now, judging by where this is, I'm going to have, you see this right here? I'm going to have just enough room for this to be able to move, but back here I may not have enough. So we'll try this out and by fitting the, wing, the top wing skin on and we'll be back with you um, with the results. All right, we've, we've, um, we've got six inches of this nylon seal sticking out of the tube. I had Miss Vicky pull on the other end while I pulled taut on this, and we put a mark on either side uh, of the bulkhead um, onto the nylon seal. We did that all the way down. Then we pulled this out, and then we rotated it and sanded the devil out of it for about an inch in length, equidistant on either side of the, not a full inch, but you know, an inch wide about a quarter inch on either side of the bulkhead. And the scratches I'm making going circ circumferentially around the piece of nylon seal. Did that at each section. And then as we got down to wing rib nine here, it goes right against the surface. So with it pulled taut, I put marks down it and I scraped up the area underneath it. I don't want this thing buzzing and transmitting noise into the airframe. Excuse me. So now we've got each one of these ribs, the area, on the nylon seal, sanded, roughed up pretty good. And now, at a distance, 13 inches out from the opening, is it clearly visible, Vicky? Here. And three and a half inches forward, we have the nylon seal coming straight out. Now we begin an arc. And the next major point on that arc, we'll describe at nine inches. At nine inches, it is two inches, two and a quarter inches from the trailing edge. And then it pretty much points straight from there at this opening. We're probably going to end our attachment of this nylon seal at about this point, allowing this to move Zoom in. Well, we'll re reiterate some of that from before. At 13 inches here, you are at three and a half. At 10, you're at two and a half. And at seven, you are two inches precisely. And that's about where we're gonna, where we're gonna end with our attachment. I'm gonna sand this area, and we'll be back with you in a moment. It's this first, oh, six straight inches, I want to make certain. Really well sanded. I'm going to remove this screw here in a moment. And the rest of it I'm going to lightly sand. So if I need to tack this down, I don't have to try and sand it while this is in place. Remove that screw for this operation. We'll be back with you in a moment. Okay. All right. Now watch the magic glue. See it mixing through the head. It's already mixed. I'm just going to put some strategically placed material here. In order to be able to go about, go about with this process, now down here, I know you can't see that one, sorry. Let's go about every foot. You don't need much of it. 
Now we're going to go on down a little ways and I'm going to put a little tension on this. And every so often you can check your tube and feel if it's getting hot. It hasn't yet. Here's our nemesis, the foam. All right, now I'm packing material right around an opening here. I'll get lucky if this doesn't just harden in the tube. This is not five minute epoxy. This is inch, this is minute and a half epoxy. And it lives up to, it doesn't say that on the tube, but in effect, that's what it is. All right, now I pull this tight here. I want this taut up in this end. Doesn't have to be, but I'm shooting for the best This is going to go off, so I'm going to take it off. It's not hot yet. But I'm going to keep a little tension on it so I get this thing straight. We'll be back with you in a moment. Okay. Okay. See, if the side is loose here, I'm going to push some of that resin inside that tube, inside the hole. And then I'm going to pull this back just a touch. And, uh, whoops, that one's already hardening on me. On that end. This, it goes off like a shot, and when it goes, it goes all at once. I'm almost ready to let go here, but not just yet. Boom, 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 boom. Securing up on me. <clears throat> if I had a chisel, I'd remove the portion. Oh, there, that's working. On the, on the other end, we're going to apply some glass. It's almost sound enough now where I can let go. There we go. All right. Firm enough now. That's good. That's good. So, we take the weights off, and um, we get ready to lay up some glass out here to fix this end, and uh, we can put little bits of, of material in other places, just enough to make sure it's not going to buzz on us um, at a later date. In flight. Back with you shortly. Back with you again. You notice we have a weight holding things in place and um, what we've discovered here is we put the top wing skin on and, and figured out that if we go any further aft than from the bottom edge of this to the trailing edge, if we go any further aft than two and a quarter, that this just about gets interfered with the closing trailing edges of the wing skin. I mix up some West, resin underneath here. We're going to do this for about two inches in length. I've sanded the devil out of it. Put the resin on. And I'll take this and mix up a little bit of flox. Push flox into the side, one ply a bid for the length of two inches, about a half an inch on either side. We're set to go. The dimension for the glass ends is from this forward edge here to here is four and a half inches. Give you plenty of room for it to flex and we'll be all set. We're back. Let's see. Let's get you a close up of this glassing business. 
My eyes are getting so bad these days, I can't tell if things are in focus anymore. All right. One fly will do us. Push that over top. And can we see that, Misha? Yes. That completes this portion of the program. It's blast in, five minute in place so it doesn't buzz. <clears throat> It'll line right up. I'll give you the last dimension here on the front end too. It's, I know it's two and a quarter in the center. It's about oh, two and three eighths at the back end. Again, at four and a half inches from the from the full, the forward portion of the cutout. It'll have quite a bit of latitude to move. We just don't want this too so far aft that, that it gets caught in that groove and not allowed to move. Its ability to, to move will help prevent a clinch at this end of the swedge to the ferrule and uh, then cause the cable to break. Which, by the way, if it does, you yank it out from this end and you run a new piece of cable in, put a new ferrule on the end and off you go. But it's not a good sign when they break because it means that there are things going on here that's going to cause them to break again. We had one recruit that did that. And uh, with that knowledge in hand, we've never had a problem with it since. Thanks so much. What you're looking at here is a tube, is a hole that's been drilled through here. Started off with a half inch drill, opened it up to just above a half inch with a, with a special file. Now Bram here is going to run the tube through and I'll guide. Okay. A little bit right there. Okay, right there. Push slowly. All right. Now this is this is very soft tube. The holes that we had drilled earlier here are just about right for. Now so just keep playing it. Oops. Stop. Okay. Now I'm going to start straightening the tube, which I can do with my hands here. Okay, ready, go through, all right. Okay, hold on, hold on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. The tube is stiff enough that while well, the time we get to the end, we're not gonna need to attach it to anything. We'll let it float. And we haven't practiced this yet on this particular plane. You're seeing it happening the first time. For real, okay, stop. We're, we're actually further than we need to be. Uh, can I come on down to this end, Mishka. Bram, you can pull. All right. Now the trick here is going to be to get everything in the right shape and guide in. This is already bent the wrong direction. OK, push a little bit. OK, hold it. Of course, you're gonna have to loop around just a little bit. There you go. It's through. Okay, good. We're inside the tube. Now what we're gonna do on the other end here is clean it up so that there's no burrs on the end. And I'm gonna move this around and pull this back and I'm gonna scratch this up, put five minute epoxy on the inside of the tube, reinsert so that we have a complete seal there. <coughs> and then we'll put some epoxy on on a few other places and make certain that it doesn't make noise squeaking around inside. That is, that is the conduit or the strobe um, three-wire conductor, shielded conductor, so we don't have noise on the other line, which is the antenna line here. They've been run before inside of the conduits that were in the, the long easy wing without noise being transmitted, but don't want to take any chances having it inside this tube. Um, makes the parts changeable, removable, serviceable. Uh, this will never be serviceable, this cable, because of the nature of how it's attached up here at this end. So we'll be back with you after we've done the, our next step. All right, you notice we've got the tube in place 
And I've got this bent so that it, it was a little more acute angle facing forward. And, I, and the marks you see here are where I'm going to sand with 80 grit. And the marks you see here, 80 grit. I'm going to get all those sanded up. I'm going to sand the other end, the inboard end as well. And then very, very quickly, I'm going to squish epoxy in here, smear epoxy. Squish epoxy onto these, maybe pull it back and forth so that you get epoxy inside. And then I'll do the same five minute operation on this that I did on the, on the rudder cable conduit. I'll get that in place, then I'll stick something on the inboard end of this tube, the, the inside of the tube, and flare it slightly so I don't damage my cables going in and out of the, of the conduit. Back with you shortly. I should be wearing gloves for this, but... Oh, blast. I forgot to sand. Back with you in a moment. All right, here we are. <laughs> this time we've sanded it all. And we start the mix again. Hope that nothing else goes wrong. Now I'm going to have to go like crazy here. So I'm going to on the tube. And smear the tube. Misha. I'm going to put the goop on this opening here and you smear the goop under the, into the hole. I'm not going to have much time. Okay, around the tube. It takes me more than a minute. I'm screwed. Okay, here we go. Around the tube. You may have to find it, Misha. Okay. Now, on this side, you can't follow me on this one, so trust me. Trust me, she said. Ooh, that was Freudian, wasn't it? Okay, here we go. I'm going to put some extra of this material on this, and in we go. Okay. That should be about it, guys, right there. Now I'm going to push material around this perimeter. Misha, here, on your finger, on your finger. Push it around that tube and give me no gaps. Remember, we're trying to seal this so that we don't um, share that atmosphere with any other. There you go. Oh, you got stuff all over your finger. Here, here, just hold still. Okay. Now I'm going to go to the other end here. You're not going to be able to wash you on this, so I'll be back with you in a minute and show you the results of, uh, of this uh, near catastrophe. Okay, recording again. Let me make sure we got sound here. And we do, we do. I'm going to give you a zoom in on that. There it is. Plenty of goo. There. And there. And lastly, the other end. That one's really clean. And uh, now I'll show you the inboard. Okay, we're back. I'm gonna just I've cut this off. It was you know it was considerably longer a little while ago. And um, so I could feed it and pull it back and forth. We'll grind this off and We can take it back quite a ways. And uh, then I'm going to put just a little flare on this using, uh, using my imagination. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. OK, this is one way to put a flare on it. Just roll it around inside the tube. It opens up the end. The further out you come, the steeper the angle gets. Stretching that tube out. And once you get out a ways, we've stretched it quite a ways. But the last little bit is what I want to flare here. And I have another tool for that. I'll be back with you in a moment. What we have is a, a regular old socket with a rather steep edge on it. Take it in a little ways. Unfortunately, this end is just a hair large. I'll get a slightly smaller one. We'll check that again.
Okay, well, we're going to use the ball peen hammer. You're watching in real time. If I screw it up, it'll be right in front of you. You can see it flaring. Shouldn't we need to be held in the shape? corner just a little bit so it, so it doesn't damage the tube or the wire coming out of it. No burrs anywhere on the edge of the tube. So we flared our tube, we're done here. Good morning. Good morning. This little section is on fuel caps. Um, first, the name of the cap is Newton, part number 05-28658, available in locking that would make this machined surface here, or I should say forged surface, that would be drilled and have a locking lug in it. Um, it's light, beautifully designed, I've been using them for years. Um, and the ring is the best I've seen in its adaptation specifically for bonding. Drill small holes around the perimeter, grip blast, coat with epoxy, bond in place. And it'll be from the underside and then apply flux into the holes and a layer of bit. And that can all be done upside down so that it just nests into the upper skin uh, of its own. We'll show you that process as we go. Cap goes in. The nice thing about it is, is that the only way the cap can be um, put into the opening is in the unlocked position. And once it is turned, it cannot come out. Um, and then when this is down, unlike the glass air cap, you can put the glass air cap in, lock this, and it'll still come out if it hasn't been turned before, before closure. Won't happen with this cap. This is the one I recommend. It's the lightest, it's very reasonably priced, it's available to aircraft spurs, buy it. Okay, we're back. To describe the installation of the aforementioned cap, we'll give you some dimensions here and show you where it goes. And there's the inboard end of the wing. There is the cap's position. Okay, the edge. My apologies, I was leaning on, the, on my transmitter in my pocket, which has a stupid mute, func mute function that gets in the way. Okay, so if you want to fudge it, give it, oh, four and a half inches inboard. That makes what gives some room for where the rib might be. And measure it from the back, right at the end of the aileron, or even the aileron trim line. Let's just use the aileron trim line. It is 19 and a half inches forward and again four and a half inches in width. It gives me a little fudge. I've got the marks marked a little closer to the tape and a little closer to this edge. You're going to fuel this with a nose down as you do the rest of the airplane. As you can see right now, this is the high point in the tanks when it's, when it's straight and level, but that is not really um, pertinent at this particular point. It's in the nose down position that it will, it will matter. So, one more time. I haven't notched into the hinge yet. 19 and a half and four and a half. All right, we were talking earlier just, just moments ago about the placement of the cap, and we have some things to consider. Since you have a quarter inch core uh, from the inside skin to the outside skin, we have to make a bevel from this depression that we're going to cut at about a 45 degree to the surface. And then we're going to cover with a ply of bid. That ply of bid might end up between the spar this lip in, on here, and the uh, inside skin. We don't want that. And the same thing could occur on this edge. So it means we should move down another um, half an inch and over another half an inch uh, to just give us an absolute, so let's say, um, I think we can go four and three quarters. 
four and three quarters, and we'll say nineteen and three quarters. Four and three quarters, nineteen and three quarters. We'll be back to show you the ugly reality here in a moment. We're back. Okay, let's drill this hole. Now, first thing is we're going to show you the hole saw slightly smaller than the lip in the center. But these holes, hole saws almost always up and we'll be back with you in a moment. Oh. Try it again. Fully committed. Well, we should be. No, <laughs> doesn't quite fit. Well, we'll start opening that up until it just fits in there nice and snug. And we'll be back to you as we flip things over and start beveling foam on the interior to receive the entire lip. Now we're back. Here's the inside of the tank. This line approximately here defines the edge of the T-tape. This edge defines the forward T-tape on the spar. So you can see we, this is the cap line. This is the bevel range, and this is the lap that we're going to have of glass in this area and here. So we're just about where we want to be. That's, uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to grind, grind away all the way to this edge, to the exterior skin, and then trim the, the opening to just fit this ring. Back with you then. Okay, here we are. We use the die grinder. Grind this. This just drops in with a little bit of room around the edge. It's a nice square end on this, so I was able to go right against the skin and cut. Now I'll go in here diagonally and cut the bevel. Being very careful not to let this bottom corner here touch the exterior skin because it'll cut right through that thin skin. And, uh, but the next thing I want to do is, is if you look, you can see this doesn't quite fit in on the inside, so I'm going to hand sand carefully until this just clicks in. Um, and I'll be back with you for the next step. We're back. After some thought here, I want to describe some things to you that um, you may be able to see the gap between the edge of the cap and here. You can also tell that there's a uh, I can go from here to this edge at a very low angle. So what I'm going to do is drill the holes in here, brush on the resin. I'm not going to put glass down here. This is carbon, you say. Yes, it is. But it is also anodized and non-conductive. So the light grid blasting will not remove the anodizing. And then I brush this with resin. This will all have been pre-sanded, of course, all the way around this opening. The entire area, actually, because this is going to be prepared for for a fuel seal. And uh, so, after we're brushing on the resin and the application of flux, squish this down inside and then do a transition between here and here um, with flocro, not pure flux, not pure micro, and then lay tape up onto it from here up onto the edge, capturing it uh, soundly between these layers. We'll, we'll go through this step by step as we proceed. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Okay, we're back. We've sanded in here. And we've sanded out about that far. Now I'm going to drill holes in this. And I'm going to drill number 40 holes in the perimeter. Inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. And um, I'll be back with you to show you that. And I'll have grit blasted and applied resin to it by the time as well. Now welcome to uh, the headless spokesman. All right, we have, um, you can see on the back side here, uh, that I've taped this lip, this, this last, this first lip here at the bottom of the, of the ring is approximately 0.2, almost a quarter of an inch wide. I've taped over that entire thing, which closes off the underside. 
I've drilled number 40 holes alternately, boom, 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 all the way around. Don't get too close to the edge, though. And then on this side, I've taken my masking tape, and I've pushed it firmly on the interior surfaces to protect them, and squeezed them off to the tape on the underside down here. And now that I've got this stuff squeezed well all the way around the perimeter, I place my razor blade in at the bottom here in that corner, affecting that. Now I'm going to grit blast these surfaces. And you know, I know that my grit blasting is probably going to lift this tape just a little bit. So I'll end up effectively still getting a bond to that edge. But that edge is only about 0.05 high anyway. We're dependent on this surface and this surface and this wall to do our sealing. It will not leak. I've never seen a ring that's bonded into this type ever, ever, ever leak. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and trim this the rest of the way all the way around. I'll show you the results in a moment. All right, we've just grit blasted, and I the minimum grit blasting. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this tape away from the lip so it doesn't get caught up in my resin process. Also note the gloves, very important. You can see clearly right here. That edge is not grip blasted. get rid of that check it all the way around now I haven't got that inside completely protected I'm going to leave the tape on both surfaces there goes the resin on the interior I didn't want to do that the tape protects me Grit blasting we did was just enough to etch the surface. I don't want to go through the anodizing because the anodize is my dielectric, prevents me from the carbon fiber. If you're concerned about it, you can put a light layer of thin glass down or full air. And there you go. Now I'm going to apply the resin to the interior of this. This is West 105-205. It's a warm day. We have a thin anodic condition going outside. This isn't going to last me very long at all. So I'm going to mix some of this to flux, and I'm going to squish this in place here and uh, I'm already centering up and the holes are already filling with resin. Um, I'm going to mix the flocks and be right back Oops, okay. on me. Okay, ignore the phone people, there's the flocks. We brush the resin on, flocks is um, thick enough to squish out and I'm going to find the center here. There it goes. Now I'll check the inside and make certain that, or the, out, the other side of the surface and make sure that it is where I want it to be. It's flush for the exterior at the moment. Now I'm going to pack blocks into this outer ring here. I said flock rubber floor, but we're not talking about enough material here to really make that big a difference. So, You can go right up against that center flange, up onto it a little bit if you wish. Not going to hurt anything. Okay, I'm going 
the brush and check the container. Let that warm up. I'll have just time to put one ply a bit around this, around the entire thing before it gets too hot. And we'll be back in a moment. Okay, I'm going to run this tape now around the perimeter. I could have cut one piece of glass with a hole in the center. Let's see how we're doing here. See if we can pull this off. If we can't, I think I'm just going to do it in pieces. So we'll be back with you in a moment after we... Now, stick with me here for a second. the wall, which is helping me make a transition of that tape along the base. We're going to do this a different way. We'll be back with you in a moment as we modify that method. Come up here, honey. Okay, we've got a piece of square cloth. Um, fold and fold. And you can look at the width of that cap neck, and you can tell it well, the radius of that's about, oh, you know, about an inch. So I'm going to come in, cut a quarter of a circumference there. Shpoink. Right there. Open, and you see it's just a hair larger than the neck. You can do that by air, or you can do it by however you wish. I'm going to mix a little more resin because my resin's gone off. The west it's warm today. I'm only going to wet out to about here, and then we'll sand the rest of that off later. And I'll be back with you in a moment. As you're seeing, as I'm putting on the second ply, and on top of the box, I'm only going to wet out again, as I mentioned before. I may end up sanding most of this off back as close as I can to this corner, and the same thing over here. But We'll check that against the fit of the tea tape when we reach that stage. With the temperature being in the upper 70s today, Vicky and I are going to go to lunch, and when we get back, this will be easily firm enough for me to trim and, uh, and handle then I'll have to sand the rest of the perimeter area and get ready for the tank seal on the Jeffco. section that is your cap installation we have a little cleanup to do the tape to remove and uh, that's it all right it's just a little soft I'm gonna leave this tape on here for obvious reasons I don't want uh, epoxy on this or even the, the sealant material on this surface um, everything that's going to get sealed is already got epoxy on it so I'm going to stand around the perimeter of this thing in preparation for the, um, the tank sealant and before this fully cures, I'm going to get tank sealant on this surface area, making certain not to get uh, into the areas where the tea tapes are, either here, here, outboard at the next rib, or on the leading edge. And uh, I'll define that as we go, and um, back with you next. Okay, here we are. We're on the other side. We'll give you a quick expose of what's going on here. Nice, clean fit. The ring is flush. It might be a hair above in a spot. We could take a, a, um, a Vixen file and file this absolutely flush. We wouldn't be losing more than 10 thousandths at an edge. Um, so we can either let it completely cure, or I can take a razor blade and clean all these surfaces off now. Not much. You can see my original proposed spot, my second proposed spot, but I moved over. And thank God we did. 
Um, it just clears everything very nicely. Cap's done. And uh, so let's proceed. Okay, real quick visual representation of what you got to have. You notice that the Jeffco sitting there, and it's about, it's not a whole lot of material, but combined, there's two parts of the resin, the gray material, and one part hardener. And it gives you uh, the uh, correct mix. And you can do it visually just across the, to the clear containers. We're going to mix that together and then apply it to da -da -da -da, that surface. And you can see that, I believe you can see the marks uh, right there, that line. That, rep that defines the perimeter of the opening. That line there, the big one. That's three and a half inches from the edge, but it might be a little different on yours. You need to just make certain by measuring that you miss the front of the spar, the just inboard of the outboard rib, and the lap area along the leading edge. And everything else will turn gray. Back with you in a moment. Can you hear me? Okay. You can see my lines here, I hope. John, can you see them? Yes. All right. First thing I do is I, I you know, you'll notice that there is sometimes sand, wipe it someplace else, you'll hear it scrape. Take it right up to that the line that you put down to define the edge of your T-tape. And this is much more important than this. We want to push this material into the porosity. So you'll see me going over it and over it and over it and over it. And at some point along this process, I'll take out a heat gun and I'll heat this. And the porosity beneath the laminate, and there always is, don't, don't, don't kid yourself, it'll bubble like crazy. And then I'll continue to push this material down into these holes. And when it cools, it'll suck the material in and help me seal it even further. Obviously, if you've got a gloss on the surface and there's no, per, no pinholes, you should have a seal. But I feel much more comfortable knowing that the material is actually filling up porosity, and I can even feel more comfortable about it. In a moment here, I'm going to come back and you can hear the sand in there. Uh, every time I do that, I should wipe it with a paper towel and take that bit of sand out of it. We talked earlier about this tape missing the T-tape edge. Looks like we've got it. And I'll get a brush and I'll brush in here as well. Get this stuff all the way up around here. Uh -huh. This glass is still active. I did not uh, let this fully cure. It's, it's hard enough to not move around, but it was also hard enough to let me taper the edge when I sand it. Okay, I think you get the picture. We'll get back to you as we apply this. Um, I'll apply a little bit of heat and we can see the bubble. All right, there it is. It's uh, pretty well covered. And um, yeah, it's really, really glossy there. Let's, see, let's take it back some. And um, if it doesn't flow the way you want it to, give it a couple of hours, come back and put on a second coat. And uh, we'll be back. But if you second coat it, be careful about the application of heat. It'll try and, it'll try and bubble up from underneath. Set. Okay. It's been about 30 minutes, 40 minutes since I put this on. And remember, the temperature was about 75 degrees. And this area here, the material began to pool down. And it really thickened up well. And uh, I, I must admit, the, the last bit of the material I put on, I put on very heavy. And uh, after a half an hour, it was tacky enough that I could remove the thicker material from here and move it up to the thinner areas. It leaves a mark. But it only leaves a mark for a short period of time. And so I can more evenly distribute the material and get a heavier coat without having to go to a second application distributed overall. It's starting to flow out now. And uh, so that's it. We're not going to do anything more with it. And that one coat will be plenty, more than sufficient. Give it a half an hour. Keep checking it until it's really firm. And then squeegee it um, to redistribute the layer. It'll also help work out any pinholes. Um, so 
So that's, uh, that's it. Let it, let it cure, and then we'll begin our, our preparation for closure. Okay, we're done with the tank, and uh, we're going to start prepping and sanding for bonding. The last thing we have to do, there may be one other, is make up a spring retract tube that goes in the vertical stabilizer. You take four and a half inches of your elevator torque tube, square it up on the ends, and I went over to the bandsaw and I put a bunch of made teeth. They don't have to be real sharp teeth, just bandsaw, a bunch of slots, about an eighth of an inch deep. I stuck it in the lathe and used the tailstock to push against a piece of plywood that I held and made cuts like this in the sheet. And um, you can go in half the thickness of the plywood. I didn't go quite that deep on this one, but half the thickness is fine. And of course, it's going to fit precisely into the tube so it doesn't jiggle around. You drill. Um, I'll show you the drilling of this for the hinge pin that you'll use as the hook on the inside that your spring hooks onto. Once we've done all that, um, I'll put this in place and use super thin, super hot super glue and drip it on the inside, which will wick into the wood, seal the wood, and bond it in place. And I'll grind the outside to match the tube final final. I'll grit blast the tube, stick it in place with five minute epoxy, and then brush it with resin and put one ply a bit over top of it with micro on both sides where it's to be positioned. And you'll notice on the winglet, I've drawn a, a black mark at the bottom of the hinge line and up about four and a half, five inches, another line, which I can see through from this side. We'll give you a view of this side in a moment. For those of you who are wondering, what is that? Well, that's two layers of duct tape on my fingers so that I can push 40 grit, 36 grit sandpaper um, for sanding the bond lines where the ribs hit these surfaces, and I've already sanded all the T-tapes and all the areas on the wing where bonding is required. And I'll show you that on the underside of this skin in a few minutes. All right, this is the inside skin. And having been able to see through, um, this line here defines my hinge line. You notice the color change? When I told these guys, my, my laminators, to run this skin all the way to here to reinforce it, they only ran it to the hinge line. Um, I'm going to have to make up for this later on because I want this skin and this skin to be the same thickness when I put the hinges in place. Um, this line, you can see at this point, it's 4.75 inches from the bottom of the rudder along the hinge line. At the back end, it's two and a quarter inches long. And this defines where I'm going to put my tube. I've also measured from here to the two vertical members on the opposing skin to determine exactly where my closeout members are. Otherwise, I won't know where to put the wire that goes here with a hook on it. I won't know where the end of this is supposed to go. Um, so the way it's going to look is like this. This is going to go right there with this on center line. And then I'll cut a notch in the um, VS1, vertical stabilizer, close out, and then I'll put a teeny notch where the wire comes through here with a hook on it, and the hook should face the center of this tube, uh, so that when I go to hook the spring up on the inside, bring the spring across here and hook it to this, it'll be right in line. And uh, we'll be back with you in a moment for the next step. All right, this is a bit of a challenge. We have our little plywood pieces I showed you before. And the hinge, this has got a heavier hinge than I've used in the past. Uh, Bercoot's always had a, a bit of a problem with not being able to feel the rudder. The rudder is very sensitive, and, and the more feedback you can get from a spring, the better off you, you, you're gonna, gonna be. So, gather up all the elements of this process. The spring, we'll give you the part number on this spring. It's a century spring purchased from Orchard Supply. Needle nose, not needle nose, but you can use the needle nose pliers if you want the needle nose vice grips. I get a hold of the end here, clamp it good, and we're going to bend this 90 degrees. Right about there. First end. And I'm going to go to here. Okay, we're going to shut off for a second for the children. 
All right, the elephants have gone back upstairs. Um, now we're going to make another bend here as close as I can to the other surface. Again, 90 degrees. I want those two edges parallel. And this is piano wire. And I believe this is like 80,000 piano wire. It's the same as, the, as, the, as a regular hinge pin, which I would encourage you to use since hinge pin is also plated. It's cat iridite plated. Now I'm going to drill a hole in this. And I can come close to centering, but I can't center precisely. If I center precisely, it gives me a problem on the inside of the tube. And I'll illustrate that here. The, the, the tube, the spring will go inside the tube. Then it's going to have to go over a mocked up hook here. And to do so, to go over this, it has, the spring has to be up pretty high. And from, the, from this point to this point, as it's going over the top, it would be, if I placed this in the middle of the tube, I'd never get the spring over this end. And if I did get it over the end, I'd certainly never get it off. And this needs to be 0.3 from here to here, 0 0.32, 0 0.35, and you can see why. Clunk. Goes over top. Now, I couldn't, I couldn't install this the way it is. I have to install it with this unbent through the wood through both holes, and then I do this final bend. I'll give you the dimensions here of this. This is a fairly good mock-up. The distance on this edge need only be a quarter inch long, since it's going to go through the plywood. This is probably just a little bit long, which that's okay. So it's 0.3 maybe. And this leg here is inch and a half from the inside edge there to the inside edge of the leg. And the distance measured this way, not this way, is 0.35. And um, you saw how I did the bending. And now I'll cut this off a little long. I'll drill the holes in this. I'll show you those positions and show you the markings in a moment. All right, All right there's the, you can see where I'm right near the edge, about an eighth of an inch away from the edge. And the width of this, where these two holes are going to be drilled is dependent on how you've bent this. So I'm going to drill this one, number 40, then I'm going to come over here and, uh, actually I'll drill the, the center one first. It's not nearly, not exactly, but 